find them like that because one does suck up more energy that or they they match up a little bit better so it's kind of like chi charging now whenever you bury it you're just and you go down to a certain level to where the Earth's natural electromagnetic field, it does create a little bit of a vortex to where it moves it faster and you can get more out of it. So I think that you have to have an outside source to keep on helping it draw. Yeah, and so from my understanding of it, it's if you have a three coil and that uh, the middle coil is the one connected to the outer um it's like a grid and then the uh coil on top and the coil underneath are your uh positive negative going into uh the jewel C circuit and your load that then uh through induction is able to somehow um cheat the system i i believe uh the keshi magrav coils also uh function in a similar manner to this from my understanding of it yeah isn't that acting more like a step-up generator than it is i don't know i haven't seen it work like that so uh i'm just gonna take your word for it man i, I believe you just i i don't know about the two coil system experimenting with uh your own cells down the road for sure yeah, in, so, in my case i've done some experiments with different style coils all involving the same exact copper mass and since I chose to use the same length of wire and from the same spool, it's just uh, it, that would pretty much give me a fairly stable, uh, consistent comparison for copper mass. So I've taken some bifiler pancakes, uh, some single filer, some bifiler, and some quadrifiler, and I have stacked those in layers to see what my transfer efficiency is. Technically, they contain the same amount of copper, and if you if you map them out, the turns end up being the same but uh the angle of the turns there's a discrepancy there and so it's it's a little strange because you get instant in, interesting transfer characteristics of the magnetic and electric flux what people don't understand about bifiler coils i think the commonly overlooked aspect compared to a monofiler pancake coil is you end up with intercapacitance between the windings and uh, normally this would be a parasitic thing that we don't want. We don't really want capacitance between the windings in most coils because it slows down the signal. But in this case, the bifiler effectively integrates its capacitance, the C part of its LC circuit, into the space between the windings, which means that an individual coil now has a given LC frequency that can efficiently recycle between the capacitance and the inductance of the circuit. Uh, Especially if you're going high frequency, because then the skin effect itself adds to that. Yeah, with your coils, you've uh, you've really pushed the boundary in terms of maximizing capacitance and minimizing inductance. You found an interesting way to spread things out so that your polarities end up being self-assisting. You still get yourself a very solid north and south pole, but they're inverted 90 degrees from the direction that you'd expect them to be for a solenoid coil where you end up with the north and the center and the south and the outside, for example, you basically take in what you should have, you know, north on the top and the south on the bottom that are the only poles that you have. And in some situations, you can effectively rotate those up to 90 degrees so that they're pointing parallel to the plane and you've changed axial polarization, um, the longitudinal polarization, which is pretty darn interesting. So that, that whole idea, what it tells you is that the intercoil capacitance is doing a tremendous amount of work. And it, the reason that's super important is if we take a look at the properties of space, you know, that thing that holds the magnetic flux allows it to transfer from one field coil to the next. What we find is that if you have a magnetic field present, the permeativity or ability of the electric field to penetrate that same space, if it's the vacuum, it's actually affected by the presence of a magnetic flux. It shouldn't be. I mean, from the classic gauging principle, you wouldn't expect an electric flux to be affected by a static or unchanging magnetic flux. And generally speaking, if, they, if they're both unchanging, you won't really see a difference. But if they're both changing at the same time, they actually do affect each other because they both act on the refractive index, that, that J-curl tensor of space-time, which is your magnetic flux, 
that's going to affect the permeativity or the ability for the electric field to transmit through space. And by building both these things up in the same direction, you can make a coil which should have, say, 100 nanofarads of effective DC capacitance act as if it's got 1,000 nanofarads. When it comes to deliver that energy back to your load, now all of a sudden you're getting 1,000 nanofarads of energy being delivered back into that system. And the reason is it built up slowly at 100 nanofarads as if it was DC when it comes back because it's an extremely high transient a back electromagnetic field. It's now going to have all the energy of that faster influx. And okay, now that all being said, on my last video, there was an anomaly that I'm not sure if anyone picked up. When I put the coil in the water, and turned on the light the light was brighter in the water than when the coil was in the water than when the coil was out of the water i, I believe that i i missed that but i did miss that too but, uh, right. i find interesting about that i better point out imagine once once we're talking geopolymers and that thing is fully embedded if the increase in in mass of the water or capacitance of the surrounding water somehow assisted the operation of that device when it's a non-corrosive geopolymer with all that density around it what will it do and how will it respond what you have to remember also that water holds energy as well i mean it's an amazing insulator but if it has an electrode in it to be honest, water is a terrible insulator. That that rule really only applies uh, if you're sitting on a test bench and you basically have like one volt to test and you're going to check the water's electrical conductivity. It will appear like an insulator. The problem is that water happens to be ionizable. It's not one of those things generally considered, but it's obvious that water is ionizable when you think about the fact that electrolysis works. That's an ionization of water. Uh, yeah. So whenever you whenever you ionize that water like that, I agree. It's gonna it's gonna help assist within that because you're drawing energy out of that water as well. All of that energy be, energy is being attracted to energy and it's catching hold. Yeah. Normally you'd be putting energy into the water with electrolysis. That's why you would end up with extra brownian motion or heat added. But if you if you precharge the electrodes under a low enough potential and you let the back mm -hmm. EMF do the work then you actually can draw that extra energy out. Yeah, and that's this is something that uh, we was talking about before you jumped on. We was talking about this water system that Mike has, and I had him take his EMF meter and hold it near it, and there's a lot of energy that's going into it. Even just uh, he had 3.2 gigahertz running through, or 3.2, uh, was it, micro Tesla uh, per meter squared? And so that's messing with that water as well. So are all the radio frequencies and all the radio signals that we have going through the air. It messes with people's water. And this is the reason that whenever you restructure the water molecules, then it, it isn't as heavy. So it doesn't just drop right into your stomach, but it will release some of that energy. It kicks it out because if you polarize it, uh, positive repels the positive and then the water becomes lighter and it's so much easier to get into your system into your body and it's also easier for plants to soak this up and for animals to drink it well let me mention something about water structuring and this has to do with gerald pollock's exclusion zone uh, i would i would imagine that probably a lot of the audience has heard of the exclusion zone or this easy uh, yep. water at this point uh, and what this idea basically states is if you have some liquid water of high purity let's just assume that this is dni deionized distilled lab grade water has nothing else in it just dihydrogen monoxide it um if left in a in a cool dark place with no physical simulation will eventually radiate off its energy and tend to destructure the brownian motion of of its natural ambient environment of room temperature will eventually cause it to dissipate any kind of structure. The exclusion don't, zone doesn't change the physical molecular, uh, or it doesn't change the physical atomic structure of the water. It doesn't ionize it. It doesn't uh, change the way that the electrons bond. What it effectively does is take light and through a very, very complicated interaction of many uh, simultaneous uh, water molecules at the same time, you end up with an assembly of water molecules aligned with their dipole moments because they've absorbed the photon over several passes. And so it's the physical structuring of the water 
meaning that it's the actual dipole moment aligned by electric field potentials that, absor that have absorbed photonic energy that create the exclusion zone. And so this is where the energy is actually stored. It's not actually stored in each individual atom on its own. It, it's stored in the physical large scale, you know, many thousands of uh, many thousands of molecules at once water assembly where it forms a semi-crystalline type of arrangement. And it happens to be hexagonal as we see almost everywhere else in nature. It's just the most efficient packing method, even though it's uh, still a very ununiformly distributed dipole molecule, it ends up packing itself into this hexagonal grid anyways. So that's- I would also uh, say, this and, is uh, add, Jeremiah, sorry, that it also goes spiral in the self-organization state too, in that crystalline um, hexagonal, it, that it- uh, We don't see the spirals there. We see a pretty even grid. It tends to lay itself out and self-structure to a line where it will, it will look like everything is nicely aligned in totally straight paths all the way down, sort of like rays, you know, going through this thing, it, you'll find that all of your dipole moments are aligned on any of many different axes. And so uh, there, there, you can do this with a spiral, though. The spiral isn't the structure of the water that's left over. This vortex of electromagnetic fields is used to concentrate and focus the energy for charge separation or to basically force align the dipoles out of whatever arrangement they're already scattered in. And when they come back to assemble, they're going to tend to automatically self-align for a moment. If there's enough energy there, they'll stay aligned. If there's not enough energy, they'll become misaligned again. But that's the whole idea is you're basically adding energy into the larger structure as a whole, not into the individual atoms. It's not, like I said, it's not ionizing. And then you're gonna end up with this sort of, sort of superstructure that emerges from it. And it's not gonna be in a vortex shape, it's gonna be in a fairly crystalline shape, but you can make it with the charge stripping aspect of a vortex because it concentrates your field fluxes. So this is uh, an example of electrolysis experiment I did with an exclusion zone of the top half that uh, is just water filled with hydrogen bubbles coming up off of the coil cathode and then one layer of the white monoatomic, and then one layer of uh, the oxidized um, copper oxide below the monoatomic. Nicely done, Bernie. Yeah. And uh, the picture I had shown before was uh, of that coil was the POE coil that you guys were referencing earlier and that uh, we covered in the first episode of the Science of Sound series. And sadly, the Nunez is, uh, for some reason, had to take down all their videos off of their channel. So this stuff isn't up there anymore. But uh, this video is showing their three-phase uh, PoE coil. And that uh, with a ground and a antenna connection uh, in the middle, um, and then your positive negative going into your load, that uh, picks up enough ambient energy to power things as well. Well, they claim it does. I, I've taken a look at the PoE geometry, and so has G. And on the, the PoE, from an electrical engineering perspective, that's where I'm coming from, it has so much lossy interwinding capacitance that can't be recycled. It unfortunately ends up wasting almost all of its flux in, in creating ionization or high potentials that are lossy between the conductors. And it doesn't encode them geometrically in an ideal format, they're all shifted 90 degrees out. So where the idea is sound, the geometry and the style of winding is unfortunately not. I absolutely agree. In fact, uh, from what I understand, there's a lot of heat that gets uh, created with the POE. I could be wrong, but uh, from what I've heard and read, the POE does produce heat. So. Yeah, and that's where a lot of loss of energy goes to. Yeah, any resistance, yeah. right? Then it's no longer cold electricity. You're getting into the uh, resistance and heat loss. I think. We yeah. Uh -oh. I found that on POE coils that you have to have a really large one. You want at least an eight inch outside diameter with a two inch inside diameter to be able to do it to where it doesn't produce that much heat, but it still picks up uh, 
ionized molecules from the air and then that'll run through and it produces its own natural frequencies mm -hmm. but within that you still have radio frequencies that all of this copper is picking up on and that can run through it as well this is why it's better to have a power source versus just having it out in the open i will give one tidbit of advice for the poe if anybody's trying to replicate something that looks like that, whether or not you use that exact geometry. Because those things are, are 3D printed anyways. Most people that make a POE are probably going to 3D print if they have a 3D printer or a friend that has one. They're going to print their own little core sections and just assemble it. It's actually a really simple device to replicate because there's not a lot going on there. But you can choose a different number of points and a different number of these individual, you know, circular rings that have cutouts for the wire. And uh, depending on what you end up doing there, there are better geometries. I, uh, this is the big piece of advice though, is it's all about the wire. Don't use magnet wire. Uh, the reason I say don't use magnet wire for the POE is the way windings are packed and wired up at the end, sort of as an afterthought to the entire winding scheme is uh, you, you end up having to try to find random series connections to wire this whole thing up. And those series connections could be distributed in any, in any which way but the interwinding capacitance of magnet wire for a system like that is too lossy. So I'd recommend a conductor one third, the total diameter of your wire and two thirds insulation. So basically your, your insulation thickness is exactly equal to your conductor thickness. And I would also recommend Teflon coated wire or something on those lines because it's, it's going to give you a far better performance. Even if the wire is thinner, it's better to go with a thinner conductor, it doesn't carry as much current. Um, to get the same number of turns and use a thicker insulation just so you can get rid of the parasitic problem that the coil geometry inherently has built into it. Yeah, sometimes parasitic capacitance works for you. Most times it works against you. In your case, it works for you. In this case, it's working against us. I would have to agree. Uh, so I don't know if Adam's still on. Adam does have a quick little demo of a small electrostatic device. It's one that uh, I, I've been working on for a while. Him and I have talked quite a bit. I'm not sure if... Uh... Uh, he was. He's been hopping in and out. He did have a decent video connection at the very beginning, and I saw a glimpse of it. I'm pretty stoked on, uh, on that, uh, the developments with it and what he's shown before. Hopefully what, he what he recommended yeah. is that you show his video. Uh, it, it, what he's building there is based on something that I've been trying to come up with for a while. And it's something that both of us have thought about quite a bit long before either of us ever built it. And it's an old idea. There are four different patents that we know of uh, which show this device. But what it is, effectively, a variable capacitor powered by a rotary disc. And that rotary disc has one polarity and the stationary plates the ones that don't move, they have a, a another polarity. And so what it's doing is, instead of a conventional electrostatic influence machine that has brushes and, you know, corona emitters and neutralizer bars and all this stuff, contact points on the physical pads, the conductors of these discs, what these things do is they use electrostatic field induction with no contact uh, to rotate and move the charge around these systems and so he's built his own version of that recommended that you just play that video and, and what we're looking at there is uh, one of those uh, sets of pads is on a small looks like cd-rom and it's on the underside hooked up to a motor and those pads are the same size as the ones on the top of this large insulating piece of plastic and so when the pad and when the underneath pads are and you can see they're connected with diodes here, so that one, one ends up being continuously positive, the other one ends up being continuously negative. When there's a difference, the charge flows from one to the other, and so there's a large electric potential that can't escape those plates. It's just sort of stuck on those plates that we're looking at right there. Well, when that passes underneath the plates that are positioned above it, those ones there, it's going to induce an electrostatic potential into those plates. But because there's an insulator between charge can't actually leap from the moving plates to the stationary plates, which means that the station and the moving plates will never lose their charge. And the stationary plates can only gain and lose whatever induced charge is there. And since it reverses every cycle, 
they're going to end up as having the same amount of charge, so they'll always be in good balance. Uh, I've done a series of experiments based around the idea that I think we can get rid of brushes, and this is what he's replicating here in, in his little demo video. Now, he hasn't shown the device operating, but he did uh, text me earlier that he tested it, and it does light up neon bulbs, and he's able to get a good electrostatic induction off these plates. So I do have a quick demo, if anyone can see it. Let's see. So, geez, let's see. So what we're looking at here is this is our underneath disc, and it's looking orange because I've got it ordered in caps on tape mostly, but there are two little pads here that are exposed and I have it hooked up to a battery right now, so we can just spin that motor with battery power. Uh, so what I want to do is I'm going to line this disc so I can charge it up. And we'll start by charging it. And the rest of these demos will follow that. Very nice. We got some real science going on. And I should get back to hooking up the Rafe coils before this is all done, so... I will let you continue, good sir. All right. Well, at this point, I'm just laying this out and going to connect these just to charge the pads. Took it a little too far. That's okay. All right, so what I have here, this disc is a sanded off CD-ROM. It has four induction plates on the top. As you can see, there's an insulator underneath. There's no plates on the bottom. And on the end here uh, is a little flash lamp with a capacitor across it and a neon bulb. Now, these are high voltage diodes and this is configured as a four phase rectifier. So, Anytime any one of these plates becomes negative, it's going to send all that negative charge down to this electrode here. And anytime one of those plates becomes positive, it's going to send that positive charge up here. And that comes out these two alligator clips to these test leads. So to show that it's induction, I have this piece of plastic. I'm just going to set it directly on top. And so we know no charges are going to get around the outside of that and actually leak off. Here we're just going to be dealing with pure induction. And then I'll go ahead and power that up. Oh, it looks like I've already shorted the damn thing out. Well, I'll get rid of the plastic because I did puncture the dielectric earlier, which was unfortunate. Let's go ahead and power that back up. I'm going to recharge it. I think puncturing that little area there affected it more significantly than I was expecting. Awesome work either way. All right. Real science. Real developments, doing the work constantly in the lab. It never ends. An alchemist's work is never done. Even when it's done, it's not done. I mean, we have revisions for a reason. Hopefully that's enough. Geez, these clips really just do not want to stay on here, do they? There we go. So there's no contact, no brushes. It's uh, coming through the electrostatic induction to the plates. Now, here was the weird part. When I checked to see what the load was on that moving disc, and uh, I had this hooked up to a power, instead of a battery, I had this hooked up to a, uh, a precision power supply, gives me my voltage and my current readout. 
whether or not I had this load hooked up, I couldn't see any load difference on the moving disc. And this system uses no electromagnetic fields to produce the power uh, from the high voltage output. So what that effectively tells me is there's a decoupled aspect of the electrostatic output generated based on RPMs only uh, that has nothing really to do with the input watts dissipated in the prime mover. And because my prime mover just natively draws due to air currents and surface friction, it natively draws about 76 milliamps in this example here, although the motor with no load draws about 10 milliamps, uh, what I could effectively do is exchange that with an electrostatic motor and increase my spacing to get rid of the air currents, could even run it in a vacuum chamber, and we would end up with uh, a system that was as efficient in rotating as it was in generating power. And since I don't see any kind of loading aspect between these two sides, I really want to find out what my exchange efficiency rate is. I wonder if there's enough power to, uh, to run this one. Probably just discharge it by touching the disc. Yeah, I did. How I really discharged it. How much does it increase your load on the motor that's spinning at whatever well, that's you exactly have what I'm that's saying. From the test measurements, it doesn't oh. increase it at all. Wow. And that's what I'm still trying to figure out is, you know, where where is the actual energy going? We know that it takes a certain amount of energy from the brushes, the frictional contacts, and the air that's being produced in terms of motion from this rotating disc powered from a DC supply. All that's going to take energy. That's mechanical losses. We're moving air. Uh, we're producing sound. The motor is increasing in temperature because it's, it's just simply rotating with no power being drawn from it, with no upper disc or anything. But what's weird is when I draw power from it, it makes seemingly no difference on the power draw from the motor. Now, it's an extremely small motor. There it is. This is a little CD-ROM motor. And so if you guys remember those little Walkman players and uh, what not uh, the original cd roms with esp which was just basically ram for cd roms so those little motors don't draw much they're extremely efficient they're designed to run off either two double a's or a little boost set, uh, uh boost system for a very long time and that's why i'm using them because they're designed to have a long lifespan and also have a very low frictional input they're not so it would make sense to me that where the one is spinning and the other one's stationary it shouldn't even really matter but uh, it's probably polarizing your pads just a little bit, and then the lens law kind of takes over for that electrostatic charge to be able to flow through it. And that may be what's helping push it to go forward, too, to where you're not creating more of a draw on that motor. In this case, I don't really think that we can have any effects from lens law since this is an entirely non magnetic system, it's purely based on electrostatic induction. So there's there's no magnetic polarization to induce a lens style effect or any kind of draw in that nature. That's that's why I'm going with electrostatics because these discs they're not going to be electro you know they're not going to magnetically respond. These are just CD ROMs and there's no metal left on them except for the metal that I've explicitly placed on them and copper is a uh, non ferrous metal. So it, we wouldn't really deal with lens law much in this case because the induction on these pads isn't coming from a magnetic flux. It's coming from the electric field. That's specifically why to study electrostatics, because we are not dealing with lens law. We're dealing with something that's a lot older. Yeah, it makes it, I have no idea then why it wouldn't create more draw whenever you're doing your inductance on it. That's wild. Dude, that's genius. I, I could explain to some extent why some of the energy is, is not being seemingly drawn or lost. And that's because it's being returned. If you think about having two capacitors that have, you know, some amount of charge in them. Let's just say we have two capacitors. They're both completely dead, but they're the exact same value. Let's say they're perfect capacitors. They have no losses. They're ultra fast ESR, whatever. Let's say we charge one of them up and we have the other one that's dead. Well, if we just exchange power between those two capacitors and we don't have any other losses in the circuit, then we never actually lose any charges. We've just simply moved where those charges are, but we've never killed the dipole. You know, we've never taken a place that has a lack of electrons and, uh, and permanently and it just uh, polarized it by giving those electrons. We've never dissipated the extra electrons on the negative plates 
and um, allowed them to flow to the positive plate. So we still end up with the same amount of charge the entire time. The reason for why there's less draw in this case, I think, is because we're exchanging charge between plates. So when this plate is negative and this plate is positive, for example, these two plates have some capacitance and it would take mechanical motion to pull these plates away from these two plates because they're already electrostatically attracted. These two plates are are neutral at that point, so they're not electrostatically repelled. They're also electrostatically attracted, but not as strongly. So if this rotor carries itself forward to the point where instead of being underneath these two plates like this, it's now underneath these two plates, 90 degrees from this position, what's going to end up happening is the charge that was trapped, the positive charge here and the negative charge here, is going to actually be moved by induction to these two plates so that these two go down to zero, and these two go up to that same potential. As you see, we've still not lost any potential. We've never actually discharged the entire thing. We've just simply moved the charge from these two to these two. Now, if we continue yeah, but... at all the way around, we're never actually losing charge. Um, and so, depending on the load, in this case, it's a direct current load. We would expect it to draw some power, but it turns out the phase leg from this dielectric is, is giving us an advantage. There is actually a way to optimize this where we tune a inductive circuit that can operate at very, very high impedance. We're talking ridiculously high impedance, huge number of, you know, primary or secondary ratio windings, maybe 10,000 to one, you know, crazier than like a, you know, a audio matching transformer for crystal radio. And what we can do is set the frequency so that this plate and this plate section, they phase the voltage between themselves in a way that ends up arriving with this plate having the perfect opposite charge before these other plates have a chance to rotate into place. And what that will allow us to do is draw these forward in the direction that we actually want to move them for the sake of creating a, a charge motion between these two. And because we're never actually losing any potential in this circuit, we're just simply exchanging the position of where that potential sits. We, we can do interesting things with it, like send it through loads and allow it to be stored temporarily and put it back in at just the right time. All that will be more complicated than a simple four-phase bridge rectifier like on this one, but this is what we're checking out now because mathematically there's not actually a reason for why this is impossible to work, uh, and the work function of motion from rotation, it doesn't compute correctly in terms of the output potentials that we're getting versus the motor power draw. There, there should be inherently more load, but there's just simply not showing up on the meter. And so we've got to figure out why that is. Yeah, it makes, it makes no sense why it's not uh, having more of a draw up on that motor, on the drive motor. Have you tried to run these and um, like set bearings in between the two plates and see if the top one is moving any to see if it is actually you know, having an effect up on the polarity to where it pushes and pulls. You mean, does the bottom rotating plate drag the top plate along? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it does. It does slightly. So it should have more draw. It should have more draw, um, but it, it drags it with such, a, such an incredibly insignificant amount of energy that uh, I'm really surprised with how minimal the return is. But here's the funny thing, like I mentioned with the tuned LC circuits and depending on your loads, uh, you can also get it to motor. So you could say, have these plates charged and disconnect the motor power completely. And you could induce an alternating current high voltage into these plates back and forth and electrostatically induce rotation into this plate. And with a tuned LC, that's exactly what we intend to do. By having current flow through the tuned LC and delivering a phase forward current or phase forward potential, excuse me, by uh, converting the current into a potential, then we should be able to get the system to self motor to some extent as well. So even with this, if you're actually dragging as it goes up, you could, you could build a step generator out of this just by stacking plates and letting them freely flow. You could, but the idea with this system was to keep it as simple as possible. One disc and one rotor seemed like an impossible challenge. I've looked at just yeah. every electrostatic influence machine throughout uh, history that I could that I could find a picture of or find a diagram of or drawing or anything. And I've not seen a pure induction machine with absolutely no brushes anywhere in the circuit. 
but the reason for that, I think, is actually really simple. You see, only 20 years ago, these diodes didn't exist. They're a fairly new thing, and the fact that I can use them on both moving disks and stationary disks is a brand new idea that hasn't been tried so far as I've been able to find out there. And so because we can revisit a very, very old idea, the original idea of the discovery of modern electricity through electrostatics, we can now revisit this old idea with new semiconductor components and eliminate some of the frictional parts and do new kinds of experiments that we could never do before, all thanks to the adaptation of modern technology. And so that's what I'm doing. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, do you think the electrostatics that's being imparted to the disc now is helping with that spin for the motor, like your efficiency? If I phase it correctly, yes. If I phase it wrong, no. Uh, there so is a way to make the load draw power from the motor. Um, if I phase delay it by 90 degrees, it, it will draw power from the motor because then it's actually uh, going to be very conventional in terms of its, its characteristic loading conditions. There we can accept 25% loss from the uh, backwards attraction, and we also increase our output current. Right now we're accepting about a 3% loss, which for some reason is not showing up on the meter. It should be, but it's not. Um, and that could be... A whole bunch of people ask what kind of diode that is, Jeremiah. Sorry. Uh, this diode is called the 2CL71. And you can buy it on eBay and Amazon. It's rated for 8 kilovolts at 5 milliamps. It's uh, one of many uh, 2C series diodes produced in China. And this particular one is nice because it's only got a diameter of like 2.8 millimeters and a length of about 8 millimeters. So it's a, a pretty compact component and they can take a pulse power of up to about 2 amps, which makes them really, really useful. But what the best part of the 2CL71 diode series is, they are some of the highest frequency high voltage diodes that I have ever tested. They are incredible. I've operated a, uh, a specific offset of the 2CL series up to 2 megahertz, and they will still operate. They're not rated there. You look at the data sheet, and it's extremely simplified. It's like a, a one or a two-page data sheet, depending on which one you're looking at. It's extremely simple, and it doesn't list off these characteristics, but they happen to be accidentally incredibly fast. So I've ordered them in droves and used them for all kinds of experiments and actually replace voltage multipliers in circuits where there's a Tesla coil present because I can rectify the Tesla coil directly with these things. The right. 20 kV version, the 12 kV versions, they are not as fast. I just want to point that out. You can go with a higher current, higher voltage version, the PN junction diode stack. It's not as quick as these. For some reason, these are just a lot faster, and I have a feeling it has to do with the very long and narrow uh, PN junction stack, because all of these high-voltage diodes, these are actually stacks inside here, inside that tiny, tiny little black chassis of each of those diodes is an array of lower-voltage diodes pushed into series, and these ones happen to have a very thin core. So their capacitance is incredibly low. And I think the only thing which really slows down a semiconductor junction is the capacitance between those layers. So because these have such a small cross section, they happen to be pretty quick. And I, yeah, uh, Bernie, I put a link uh, to the Amazon that's on it right now in the YouTube right. chat. If you want to pull up that data sheet, it's very interesting. Uh, do you mind posting it actually in the private chat? It would be easier for me to access. Yeah, let me see if I can text it to myself. I'm just certainly hoping I got that number right. Well, I guess I pulled up the data sheet, so must have gotten the number right from memory. Yeah, actually, the 2CL71, that's what's in this charging multiplier. This thing has a, it's like a 40 or 45 kV output per side or something like that. And uh, there, it's a split rail, so one of those sides is positive, one of those sides is negative. So I get pretty you know, decent long arcs, about three or four inches between those. Uh, just as a, a reference of what it can do for a practical purpose, but that's all being run off that same series diode there. All right, it's in private chat. 
And I just found what YouTube channel you posted it on. It was mine. Sorry. Thank you. And for all to see, let's see, Amazon diodes. Oop, So the link is uh, now in the live chat for everybody. Anyone interested in getting and playing with these amazing new pieces of technology? All right, um, hour and 15 minutes in, uh, ominous good sir. Do you want to take it away with the uh, intermission and uh, anybody just, uh, yeah. Only if it's all right with the audience because we've been learning so much that we might need a break from another form of sound frequency. <laughs> it's ominous. Hang on, let me tune this frequency. Shit! Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Now let's scratch, scratch. Come on, rewind that. Shish kebab. change again <laughs> Hang up. 
<clears throat> such a talk about compact discs. They always have these skip, 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 skipping, skip, skip, skipping problems. <laughs> it's brought to you by Duff Beer. There is no other. Get over here! <laughs> Well, shut up, up, shut up, Lee. That's what just a science is. Just it's a science. It's just, just Jeremiah is a genius, and everyone here damn well knows it. <laughs> just build, build, yeah. Now I'm gonna head it right back to you. Where are you there, Bernie? I'm in a speed box. Check me out. Hope you didn't mind. I don't want to like get too much. That into was it. amazing, bro. Oh, awesome. 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 Thanks. I'm gonna shut the hell up now. Oh, don't you don't have to, but love it and feel free always to ask any question as well, kids. <laughs> All right. Oh no, I like listening. There's always uh, 